Oh, there. Oh, sure. oh we're, yeah. we're gonna get a cascade. What? I'm looking at a live stream. I'm oh, looking yeah. at the live stream. Dude. Hmm? Six thirty in the morning for a No, five, seven, seven thirty. You only an hour. Only an hour? Yeah. But then there's the whole arrogant fans in the yeah, we're gonna get it. Hey, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Kevin Briggs. What up, dude? Doctor Miller. Well, I'm not quite. Oh, okay. so, How was it? She in half an hour. Yeah, that, oh, looks, that looks right. Correct on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Is that the live the the one then? That's fine. I love this game for free bagels. Load up, man. There's 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 plenty. There's coffee. Uh, someone went to grab the orange juice that they couldn't find. Are they going to be practically here? Uh, <laughs> that would be awesome if there was enough. No, yeah. Meredith and Mark are supposed to be here. Okay. I saw him, I saw Mark downstairs. There's some orange juice. <laughs> See you up next. Yeah. All right. Yep. Can I have Sandia? Do you have your uh, date set yet, Tim? Uh, no, I'll be coming back from my defense. Just over there for me. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, I start Sandia January uh, January 16th. And I'll come back in April or May to defend. So. Which uh, is Andy and Livermore or is Andy? No, the real one. With all the moves and stuff. So, did uh, um, Derek good job at Livermore? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm in Pleasanton. Postdoc, right? Postdoc. Postdoc. Yeah, he's on this one. Yeah, there's a bag. Uh, okay. Yep. Morning. 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 So I just tried to call Rob and he rejected the call. <laughs> <laughs> let's not, let's, let's, that's not a sign. Let this be a sign. Thanks to Cal, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rob's like, you yeah, know, I don't know. It's been a good five years. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you. So what do you do in San Diego? I'll be a senior ID engineer working on warhead stuff. Nice. That's so cool. Why is everyone freaking texting me? Because you're the It's Rob saying, actually I do want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we have this issue like a month ago? That was on a different computer. <laughs> so now we have the same issue on this computer. Rob's full. Blame Arash for this one. This is his computer. Uh -huh. so, Nate, CC me. Hang on, Skype as you need to update it. All of our five only What is it doing? I'm supposed to. Mm -hmm. Where's our action? Just for fun? Where is, where is
the spyglass thing in the corner. I have an idea. Anybody have a flash drive handy? Nobody really. A room full of engineers. And nobody has a flash drive. I'm gonna use my computer for the Skype call because it's updated and I can't figure out what's wrong with our rushes. Uh, but then I just need to. Viewers Who had one? Somebody said they had one? I've got one. Uh, attempting to. We're having to swap computers because Skype's not working on one of them. So we're in the process. So Mary, you better use things Well, that's rock, does what, uh, that one. Back. Yeah, pull just pull that off, and then we'll, uh, they should. I'm guessing Rob will dial oh. in. <clears throat> I think it's muted. Will you? Uh... Okay, it's just me. <laughs> yeah, turn the video on and rotate it. Okay, this is. Yeah, that's the that's the official one. <laughs> we had to switch computers. Yeah, this is the this is the biggest one that we could. <laughs> Let's see. The space here, and then they're gonna want to see the screen. That's fine. Hold on. We're gonna move the laptop in just a second. Okay. Perfect. Hey, Nate. Hello. Sorry, it took us a little bit to get connected. No worries. We it just was a computer issue. We'll uh, we'll be figured out here in a second. Which are you in upstairs in Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 3660 or whatever. Yeah. I guess for how early in the morning it is, live attendance won't be that great. <laughs> Not not we're beyond capacity here actually. Oh. <laughs> where's where's, where's all that? It is. Hey, Eric. Hey, Kevin. How are you going? The screen's moving really fast. There you go. Sorry. I'm, ba I'm a bad driver. Eric, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever said anything up to the distributed generation people about that? No. No, I, I didn't. Um, I'll send them something out right now, okay? Thanks. You know, usually we're all on the thing together, so, you know, a lot of, and so I, I clearly screwed up. Sorry, hold on. I, 
Well, the name is only what is not, so. But Arash can grow for sure. <laughs> Where is Arash? This is his responsibility. <laughs> Okay, I think everything is uh, is where it's supposed to be. Who's running this show, Rob? Um, is there any local person there? Maybe they can introduce you and. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, we are here for uh, Nathan Miller's PhD defense. Um, so this is the way uh, that we're going to organize this and Nathan will give his presentation and I'm assuming you're okay with questions during the presentation. Is that fine? Yeah, whenever if people want to ask during that's fine or uh, save them for the end, whatever, okay. I mean whatever seems appropriate. Yeah, okay, no problem. so we'll go ahead and hear the presentation, then we'll take questions from the general audience. If you have some questions, go ahead and ask Nathan at that time. And then after we're finished with those, we'll excuse the audience and we'll just have the um, PhD committee who will examine Nathan, whatever else we want to talk about. <laughs> that sounds frightening. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> All right, so go ahead, Nathan. Perfect, thank you, Meredith. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to say a uh, special thank you, obviously, to my advisor, uh, Dr. Rob Stoll, and to, to the rest of my committee members for the for the, the help and the advice and everything throughout this process. Uh, also, uh, although he's not on my committee, I owe a big thanks to uh, Walt Mahaffey, who's here on the on the Skype call as well uh, from from Oregon. He's been a collaborator with us throughout this work and and has been pivotal in in getting to this point. So uh, big thanks to to the USDA and especially to Walt. Uh, so I'm going to be talking. Uh, kind of as just a an overview sort of of what I've been doing for the last five years. Obviously, the amount of work I've done is considerably more than can be covered in in a you know a single lecture, a single presentation. And so this is going to be I'm going to try and keep a relatively high level. Please, like uh, like we said, ask any questions if there's anything that um, that that is unclear or that you would like to discuss further. So uh, just an outline of what we're going to go through. I'm going to kind of introduce the topic a little bit about the motivation, sort of the scope of what we are working on, and then three specific aims uh, that were part of my research. The first, looking at uh, the sort of momentum and turbulence fields within uh, within a vineyard, and I'll, I'll explain more in detail as we go. And then aims two and three are looking at particle dispersion within the vineyard uh, during periods when the the winds were roughly aligned with the with the vineyard rows, and then also during periods when the winds were uh, were were varied uh, away from being aligned with the rows. And I'll I'll explain all of that in detail as we come to it. So, kind of the motivation and introduction for this, there were two at least is is. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there were two primary motivations for this project. Uh, the first was a purely scientific sort of question where nobody had basically investigated this and as scientists that, you know, intrigues us and is something that we want to look into. And so I pulled this quote from one of Brian Bailey's recent publications that most of our understanding of particle transporting canopies is based on dispersion in dense, horizontally, uh, horizontally homogeneous canopies and that transporting complex canopies remains an open, an open question. So. A lot of the research that's been done on particle dispersion and scalar transport uh, in canopies has, has not really been done in this sort of an environment, and so it was one that was of interest to us. The other primary motivator comes partly from our, our USDA partners, uh, which, which... No, uh, don't worry about me. <laughs> I heard a noise, wondered what was happening. Uh, the other comes partly from our USDA partners, where they were really interested in looking at particle dispersion in vineyards out of a, a, a management uh, sort of, of interest, where uh, there's multiple pathogens that are that that cause problems in vineyards that can cause uh, large yield losses uh, on on the growth of grapes on a seasonal basis. One of the primary ones they're interested in is grape powdery mildew, and an important uh, piece of the of the life cycle of grape powdery mildew is the transport of spores uh, in the air through the vineyard um, during the growing season. So they're really interested in and in being able to understand that transport and know how to how to mitigate the the effects. 
Uh, so just briefly, uh, as I said, the scientific question was more out of a sense that most of the canopy transport studies have been done in canopies that were dense, homogeneous sort of canopies, things like wheat fields and corn fields. There's research on, uh, in these that goes back 30, 40, 50 years even. Um, in recent years, there's been work on much more complex sort of environments, um, starting an, an easy example being the forest edge sort of stuff that's been done in the last couple of years where people are looking to transport into a forest or out of a forest. Uh, but still, it's a relatively dense canopy. We're just looking at the edge of it. Uh, recently as well, there's been some work done on, on windbreak flows and looking at particle transport kind of into the windbreaks and deposition into those, kind of going up in complexity here on some of the recent work that's been done. Um, and perhaps some of the most complex uh, particle transport and, and momentum transport studies of recent years have been done in urban and, and quasi-urban canopies, including here in Salt Lake Valley where particle dispersion experiments have been done here in the valley. Um, and with all of these though, none of them uh, though they all have similarities to vineyards, none of them are exactly the same as a vineyard. So there was still a hole sort of in the research there that was something that we were very interested in. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, mostly Brian, uh, Brian Bailey and myself have been working on, on some of this research and have published some papers on it. Brian more from sort of the computational standpoint and me from the, from the experimental standpoint. Uh, so the main sort of questions with my dissertation that we wanted to address, the main, the main goal here was to identify and understand the processes and environmental factors of highest importance to the spread of windborne particulate in sparse rural oriented agricultural canopies. I know that's a lot of big words and it's kind of crazy. Basically, we're just looking at how, how particles get blown around in a vineyard. Um, and really specifically wanted to address how the canopy architecture combined with the local meteorological conditions dictated the shape of those, those particle plumes within the canopy. So aim number one uh, that I'm going to go into in a minute is uh, was mostly just based around the, the flow conditions, uh, the, the turbulence and the, the momentum, uh, the, the actual wind within the canopy itself. And again, looking at how the canopy geometry combined with those local conditions uh, is different than, than what we see in other, in other canopies um, and, and you know, what influence that has. And this was studied through uh, looking at just meteorological data from towers that were set up in Oregon. Uh, aim number two, as I said before, is looking at particle dispersion. So this is fungal spore-sized particles that we're releasing into canopy. And aim number two specifically was looking at what we figured was one of the simplest cases of that, which is where the particles are, are being blown basically parallel to the vine row direction. Probably the simplest case of, of particle transport in the canopy. So we started with that. And then aim number three is looking at that particle transport, but now looking at all wind directions and looking at the effect, the effect of wind direction on that transport instead of just looking at the parallel cases. So I'll start with aim number one, uh, talk about the field study, uh, some of the interesting sort of result, uh, methods and results that, uh, that I use for this. Uh, there's, it's going to be, there's a lot of really dense stuff in here that's not necessarily that important to go into all of the details on, but, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to just give you kind of a high level sort of story of, of what was done. So the vineyard that we worked in specifically uh, was just near Monmouth, Oregon, a relatively flat site, though there's, you know, little kind of undulations you can see in the picture that I took there on the right. Uh, north to south oriented rows at about two and a half meters um, uh, separated. When you mean north to south oriented rows, what is the orientation? The streamwise or the perpendicular? So the, north to south? Yeah, the actual, like we're looking almost north here. So the, the rows themselves are oriented almost due north to south. They actually do that to benefit uh, so that they get light penetration into the canopy as the sun goes over during the day. You get light to the entire height where if you do north to south, one side, or excuse me, east to west. One side would always be shaded. So north to south is pretty common, and these are almost exactly perfect dead on at, at true north to true south. Um, two different field campaigns, uh, one in 2011, one in 2013, uh, both about a month long uh, that I spent basically every day out there in the field working. Uh, so the meteorological towers that we used in 2011, uh, the one on the left here uh, with four Campbell Scientific uh, sonic anemometers at the heights you see up to five meters. In 2013, uh, upped our game a little bit, doubled the height of the tower, and had six sonic anemometers instead of four. We kept four at roughly the same heights that were used in 2011, um, just added one in at, at kind of the mid canopy height and another one obviously up at 10, 10 meters. Most of the results I'm going to go through here are from the 2013 campaign just because of the better re resolution, uh, but there's also data from the 2011 campaign on a lot of the plots that, that matches up relatively well. So. Uh, one thing to mention here at the beginning uh, that will get used kind of throughout, I, I started doing the analysis using a streamwise aligned coordinate system, which is kind of the standard way that these uh, micro-met experiments are typically done. Uh, quickly realized that there were 
it was going to be much more difficult to kind of interpret the data using that coordinate system, especially because of the rotation of the velocity profile with height into the canopy. And so after, you know, trying things for quite a while, I ended up changing to more of a, an engineering system, fixed system that's similar to that that's used in, in street canyon sort of studies where you use a, and a long row velocity component and a row orthogonal velocity component. So I refer to them as U perpendicular and V parallel. So for winds out of the southwest, you would have a positive U and a positive V, uh, makes perfect sense. It, for winds out of any other quadrant, on the other hand, um, you end up having to do a sign correction basically so that my mean velocities in the mean direction are still always positive, negatives then are fluctuations away from that mean direction. And what this then essentially does for me is reduces the entire coordinate system to a 90 degree coordinate system. So I use this variable delta uh, that is basically the angle between the vine row direction and the above canopy mean wind direction. And so then because every quadrant can operate under this coordinate system, everything can be done from a zero to 90 degree coordinate system. So everything that you're gonna see throughout this is, is uh, plotted against delta from zero to 90 degrees. Um, Took all of the data from both the 2011 and 2013 campaigns. Uh, after an OGIVE study figured out that 30 minute periods, which is pretty standard anyway, was the appropriate averaging time to use. So I split all of the data from both of those campaigns up into 30 minute periods, categorized all of those periods according to the direction delta, um, as well as a stability classification determined at the canopy top uh, using the Abukov length as defined there. So from the 2013 campaign alone, that's how many 30 minute periods I had in each of the categories going from parallel to sort of perpendicular classification for direction and convective to, uh, to stable for uh, stability classifications, which correlates pretty well with the time of the day. Um, okay, so I wanna hit a few of the, the kind of more novel and interesting results, focus on a few of the newer ones that probably haven't been seen by, by most of the people here, stuff that wasn't really in my proposal defense uh, when I did that before. Uh, this is only a tiny portion of the stuff that's in there and even it, it's really dense, and I promise I've tried to trim it down as much as I as much as I could. But um, most of you have probably seen, if you've been to any of my presentations or from my proposal defense, will remember the wind roses that I've shown before that basically demonstrate that regardless of sort of what the wind direction was above the canopy, that down inside the canopy itself, the winds are basically always channeled into a row parallel direction, either out of the due north or out of the due south. Uh, the perhaps a better and, and more robust way to look at that. Um, is by looking at photographs of the velocity profiles themselves. So again, this is the 2013 data. Really the only thing important to take from here, we could talk about this for days, but uh, if we look at the black lines um, here, this is for the, the roughly row parallel um, periods. And we're looking at the U perpendicular component versus the V parallel component uh, normalized by the wind magnitude at 10 meters. So as we go from 10 meters to five meters to three meters and down into the canopy, you notice that the ratio between U perpendicular and V parallel stays essentially the same. U perpendicular is nearly zero. V parallel is, is always non-zero. So during these periods, the wind is basically the same direction from top of the tower to the bottom. If we then look at the, the cyan line over here, so this is the periods that I categorized as, as roughly row perpendicular. Um, you'll notice high up on the tower, 10, 5, 3 meters. U perpendicular is considerably larger than V parallel. Makes sense up above the up above the canopy. The winds are roughly perpendicular. That's what we're. That's why they were categorized this way. But then when we look at the anemometer heights that are down in the canopy, uh, what you notice is that V parallel stays relatively constant, and U perpendicular goes to zero and even goes slightly negative for for uh, many of the periods on the average. And so, even though the winds are are nearly perpendicular up above, when you get down to the canopy top, you're at some sort of an angle, and down inside the canopy itself, you have basically no perpendicular component uh, of the velocity inside the canopy. Um, staying with um, just kind of velocity and momentum information, one of the aggregate variables that's often used in canopy studies like this is the shear length scale as defined in the top right corner. Um, again, we could talk about this for days, but the, the simple thing to, to kind of observe here is that the shear length scale decreases as our angle from, from parallel to perpendicular increases. So what this means is that for perpendicular, or excuse me, for parallel periods, the wind at the canopy top um, usually has a higher uh, magnitude, higher speed, and also the gradient of the velocity at the canopy top is, is more gentle. There's a smoother transition in the velocity at the canopy top compared to perpendicular, where the wind magnitude at the canopy top is relatively low, and that gradient of the velocity is much more harsh. Um, by way of the, the mixing layer analogy, uh, what this sort of means is that for parallel periods, there's a much thicker sort of region at the canopy top where you have shear instabilities that are generating turbulence. 
you're going to have larger sort of turbulent structural formation, perhaps space further apart moving along in the row parallel direction, where for perpendicular periods, you have a much thinner layer of, of shear generation. You're going to have smaller uh, turbulent structure formation, perhaps closer together, moving in the real perpendicular direction. And this, this change in the shear length scale with wind direction behaves almost identically to uh, published research that sh shows change in the shear length scale as a function of canopy density, where less dense canopies have higher shear length scales, more dense canopies, really thick, dense canopies have, have lower shear length scales. And so you could interpret this somewhat as saying that when the winds are blowing parallel to uh, the vine rows, it's as if the winds are seeing a less dense canopy than when the winds are blowing perpendicular to the vine rows. Even though the density of the canopy on the whole doesn't really change, the sort of signature that the canopy has on the wind does. Um, in a similar vein, uh, I, I very briefly here, I don't want to go into the details, but looking at components of the flux tensor, um, so this is looking at, at all the stress components in every direction, basically, uh, you know, caused by the wind inside the canopy. Uh, one of the very interesting things that we came across was that the, the flux tensor itself is asymmetric. So what I mean by that is uh, in a free stream flow or in a homogeneous canopy using this sort of a coordinate system, you would expect that the components of the flux tensor that are perpendicular to each other would be equal when the winds are at 45 degrees. So there should be a symmetry there. There's no reason that the flux tensor should be biased one way or another in a free stream flow. But because of the architecture of the canopy, there is a, there is a bias, there is an asymmetry, and different components of the flux tensor cross at sort of different points. But somewhere around 40 degrees is where uh, the flux tensor actually becomes uh, symmetric. So this just creates a bias towards flow in one direction, and you get a, an anisotropic drag. And I say all of that basically to just get us to this plot. Um, so this is the displacement height as a function of uh, the wind direction. You can think of the displacement height, perhaps the easiest way to think of that is the total drag of the canopy. Um, if, if it's, a, it's an aggregate variable based on the definitions at the right, but it, it, it's, a, it's a way to just say this is the total drag of the canopy and the total, you know, the total drag that the canopy has on the mean wind direction, or on the, excuse me, the, uh, the, the mean wind flow. So what we see is if we go from parallel flow to perpendicular flow, basically there's an increase in the drag and this is caused partly by that anisotropic drag created by an asymmetry in a flux tensor. So during parallel periods, as I said before, it's almost like the canopy is less dense. The density hasn't changed, but because of the orientation, it's, you ha end up having less drag on the wind than during perpendicular periods uh, where the drag is essentially more. Again, behaves basically like a density change. Um, Oh, may, may I interrupt? Please, yes. In your previous, there, your U star and your average U, is that the square root of the different components or just the streamwise dominant direction? Uh, for what the figure D, you get these the here. Star. Yeah, yeah, that U star, how is that? What uh, so uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's U prime W prime squared plus V prime W prime squared right to the fourth root. And the coordinate system doesn't actually matter, right? Because if you're using a streamwise aligned system or a, a fixed row aligned system, it changes the magnitudes of those, but they, when you square square root them, it ends up being the exact same. Um, your, your friction velocity ends up being the same value regardless, right? So uh, it was on uh, three or four slides back. I think I had a definition of it, but yeah, it's, it's the traditional definition, but the coordinate system shouldn't matter, so good. Um, so, some of the more recent work, and uh, again, the density is huge here, I, I realize that, um, and we don't need to go into the details, but looking at uh, the turbulent kinetic energy, so the total, basically, energy contained within the turbulence that is, that is within the flow, um, defined by the, very, uh, the equation at the top, and then this is the standard uh, turbulent kinetic energy transport equation, uh, which, I mean, anybody that's done any of this has seen before. Um, you know, not important the, the details on this necessarily, but this is the standard equation that's used for canopy flows, <coughs> excuse me, um, using the assumptions and stuff that are listed at the bottom. Using my coordinate system, uh, on the other hand, uh, makes this a little bit different than what the traditional way is that is normally in the literature. And so I, I spent quite a while, went through all the derivations and everything, and there's actually some extra terms that sort of pop out when you use my coordinate system. Put my coordinate system in, apply all the appropriate assumptions, reduce everything down, and you're left with this for the transport equation where I'm assuming steady state uh, for the zero on the left. But the important thing here is I have 
two terms that are shear generation terms. So this is this is stress that's generating turbulence, uh, a turbulent transport term. Two terms that then are wake production terms. So this is this is production of turbulent energy by the wakes of the individual vine elements themselves. Uh, a buoyancy term, dissipation term, and a residual. Uh, the dissipation term I calculated using a second order structure function approach. Uh, not important. It just it took me a really long time to do it, so I'm really excited about it. So is this new term that you're telling what it comes from the dispersive fluxes on your prior slide? Or uh, no, so we based on based on one of Brian Bailey's publications of the last couple of years, I actually have neglected the dispersive term. It's also not really possible to calculate the dispersive term using a tower of sonic anemometers, uh, just because you don't have you don't have planar averages really that you can take the, the deviations from. So these actually these actually come out um, from the shear term here, and it's some of the terms that are typically end up being neglected because of a streamwise aligned coordinate system can't be neglected because I'm using a different coordinate system, right? But then if you're using the tower, it is not possible for you to do the spatial average. Right? Correct. Uh, there's there's a paper by Myers and Baldocki from 1991 where they make an argument for how a sonic anemometer, though it can't represent necessarily a planar average, uh, in a re really weird kind of horrible uh, magic arrow sort of way, they say is acceptable for doing the, the averaging operator of both time and space sort of simultaneously um, for canopy fluxes. I, it's it's it is really a kind of a, a jump that they make. Myers and Baldocki gave me permission, so I went ahead and ran with it. And it's sort of the standard way that people do it at this point because with the instrumentation that we have and the sort of it's I mean it's kind of the way that it has to be done. And the results seem to seem to work out when compared to. Uh, wind tunnel studies and and like LDV and PID type studies and stuff. So it seems to work out. They gave me permission. So <laughs> um, anyway, we're not going to go through all the details on this. Really, the main thing I'm just I'm going to I'm going to point out is the is sort of the trade off between the shear terms and the, and the wake production terms because those are the ones that are really interesting for this study specifically. So. Uh, ignoring everything else, if we look at shear, the, the red line, so we've got a, a parallel, a row parallel oriented uh, shear production term and a row perpendicular oriented shear production term, which are the two red lines. Um, roughly row parallel periods that we're looking here under neutral stability. You notice that the, the perpendicular shear is essentially zero and the shear generation from, from the row parallel winds is basically makes up the, the entire magnitude of the shear production. And as we go towards perpendicular winds, you notice that they that they swap each other at perpendicular periods. The parallel component basically goes to zero. The perpendicular component dominates. But perhaps the the, the more important thing, and the thing I want to point out here, is the range of heights over which shear production is actually taking place. So during parallel periods, we have a relatively broad range of heights there um, that's actually centered a little bit above the canopy itself, where you have shear instabilities that are that are that are leading to to turbulent generation. And as we get to perpendicular periods, you notice that that range of heights is considerably thinner, uh, the red line on the far right, and it's actually concentrated at the canopy top instead of above the canopy. And this goes back to what I was saying before about the shear length scale, where during uh, parallel periods, you have a relatively wide zone of shear that's leading to turbulence. Um, and during perpendicular periods, it's a much, it's a much thinner layer of, of turbulent generation right at the canopy top. Similar sort of behavior with the wake terms, the other ones I want to point out, the black, so you notice Again, the parallel component dominates, and then the perpendicular component dominates. But again, relatively wide zone kind of covers the entire depth of the canopy to a relatively small zone that's centered at the canopy top. And you have much calmer, uh, much less turbulence, much calmer winds uh, down in the depth, you know, in the lower portions of the canopy than during the real parallel winds. So during parallel times, larger structures penetrating sort of all the way to the ground during perpendicular times, smaller structures perhaps closer together, but being concentrated right at the canopy top and not penetrating nearly as deeply. Um, last from of the results from this, and then I promise we'll move on to less dense uh, sort of stuff. So again, without going into too much of the details, this is the turbulent energy spectrum of the vertical velocity component um, versus a, a scaled frequency. Um, Really, the only thing to, to notice here um, is, is the change in the dominant scale as we go from parallel to perpendicular winds. So looking at the, uh, the anemometers that are in the canopy itself, the green and the black lines, basically where the peak uh, of those spectra are at and what scale that happens at during parallel periods versus where those peaks are at and what scale that's at during uh, perpendicular periods. And basically during parallel periods, the, size, the dominant scale of turbulence in the canopy 
1.6 times the row spacing. So the row spacing being two and a half meters, 1.6 times that is the, the dominant turbulence scale of the vertical velocity during parallel periods, where when we go to perpendicular periods, the dominant scale of vertical turbulence of, of yeah, of the vertical component of the turbulence is right at the row spacing. So it shrinks considerably, and again, same argument as before, relatively large structures penetrating into the canopy, smaller structures not penetrating as far and centered at the canopy top. Uh, that's the main story that I sort of wanted to tell with that. Um, that, like I said, that is a small sample of the, of the stuff that I've done with this data, and, and, and I would you know, send you to the dissertation or uh, to the publication that is about to come out from this. So um, it's chapter two of my dissertation, and we've actually submitted that for its under review in, in boundary layer meteorology right now, um, if you're really interested in a lot more of the details that I already gave. Um, so moving on, aim number two, looking at particle dispersion in the vineyard, um, specifically under periods when the winds were, were oriented roughly parallel to the vine row direction. As I said, we thought this was one of the, the simpler cases to do, and so we started with this one. So the actual particle dispersion experiments themselves, uh, we use these inert, inert fluorescing uh, microspheres from, from a company called Prospheric. We have three different colors of them that you see there at the top. Uh, they had a distribution of diameters for each one of the colors, but had mean diameters and, and, and stats that were very comparable to the spores of interest to, to the USDA, the, the uh, fungal plant pathogens that we were interested in. Uh, we released these particles into the canopy using a couple different release devices. So in 2011, we used these vibrating funnels um, that you see at the top. And then in 2013, uh, we used the ultrasonic nozzles that you see on the left with the, with the syringe pump, where basically we take the, the fluorescing particles and suspend them into a solution, uh, load them into the syringes, pump them through these nozzles. So we had three different nozzles oriented at different heights inside the canopy. And as the, as the, uh, as the solution comes out the end of the nozzle, the ultrasonic uh, nozzle vaporizes it and so it just releases the particles into the air from a point source. And as I said, we release these at different heights in the canopy simultaneously so that we have multiple plumes um, kind of going into the canopy simultaneously from different sources. All of this stuff and the stuff on the next slide was all controlled with a wireless network so we didn't have to be in, you know, messing with things when, when the releases were actually being done so that we weren't, we weren't affecting it. The sampling of the particles uh, was done using these rotating arm impaction traps that uh, our, our partners with the USDA built. Um, so each one of these is just a DC pancake uh, motor with a with a cross arm on it with a sub two substrates at the end that basically spin around each other at a really high speed and sweep the particles out of the air so that any particle that passes into that volume is collected on the substrate. You can then count those particles and convert them into uh, into mass concentrations that can then be um, you know can then be studied. These uh, traps were mounted on the towers you see at the right at five different heights, um, slightly different heights between the two years, but uh, um, you see how they were mounted. And then we had uh, a large array of these towers downwind of the point sources uh, where we could, you know, we're collecting these concentrations in a large three-dimensional uh, three dimensional array downwind of the sources. We always had at least 20 towers uh, downwind of our source, so at least 100 points in a, in a three-dimensional space on each one of these, usually within... Uh, just about maybe a handful of canopy heights downstream. Each one, they were a little bit different from year to year, but within six or eight canopy heights downstream, at least 100 uh, data points in each one. So decent resolution of the plume in three dimensions um, gave us some, some really good data. So the actual release events themselves in 2011, uh, there were six different periods during which we released particles and we had two colors during each one of them. So a total of 12 plumes. These have been published in a paper that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, in 2013, we repeated the experiment, again, had six uh, good periods. Um, so notice that the wind directions are all, you know, relatively close to, to real parallel. During each of the 2013 ones, we actually had three colors at different heights in the canopy, so a total of 18. Uh, these have been analyzed, and there's an upcoming manuscript um, that I'll talk about the, uh, on, on those 18 plumes as well. So first thing I did uh, with the 2011 data, we just looked sort of qualitatively at them at what sort of what sort of conclusions could we get to? What sort of approach did we need to take here? And so this is just uh, one of the events. We're looking at uh, isosurfaces of, of a scaled concentration downwind of the source here, the mean wind direction uh, oriented in the direction of the blue arrow there in the middle. And just qualitatively, a couple things that we found is that the plume, again, follows the vine rows, which makes sense. Even if the wind is off by as much as about 20 degrees, the plume tends to go sort of in the vine row direction than in the mean wind direction. Uh, makes sense. That also ends up creating a span-wise skewness in the profile, so the, the kind of bulk of the mass was being channeled down the vine rows, but because there was still 
sort of a stress in the other direction, you end up with a long tail head, uh, pointed back towards the main wind direction. So trying to figure out a way to analyze this uh, for, for concentration, uh, dispersion in all sorts of environments and everything, uh, everybody, you always end up going back to the advection diffusion equation. So this is just kind of the governing PDE for, for uh, dispersion of a, of a scalar in a three-dimensional space. Um, your kind of streamwise advection term uh, uh, equal to your, your diffusion terms in your spanwise and your vertical direction. This equation, absolutely all of the assumptions that go into this equation are completely violated in a vineyard canopy. This really only works for isotropic homogeneous turbulence like free stream flow sort of stuff, but it's a good starting point and, and, and we just kind of ran with it from there. Uh, the most common solution to the advection diffusion equation is the Gaussian plume equation. Um, that you see here where basically your concentration in three-dimensional space is dictated by a term that, that accounts for the spread in the spanwise, a term that accounts for the spread in the vertical, um, and your, your kind of velocity. The, then uh, your, your spread, your standard deviation in the spanwise and the vertical are then functions of your downstream distance. And what this, what this equation basically looks like in three dimensions, um, I wish I could take credit for this figure, but I stole this from, uh, from Stocky 2011 because it's amazing. Um, so, Resolution's kind of bad there, but this is the quintessential smokestack problem where you have a plume that's being emitted from a source. It establishes itself along a, a plume center line, um, and then as you go, as it's infected downstream, it spreads out in the spanwise, it spreads out in the vertical, and you have roughly Gaussian distributions that, that, that define that shape. So the problem with this for the vineyard stuff, as I said before, is it, it doesn't have a way to account for the fact that the plume was channeled into the vine row direction. Uh, and it doesn't have a, a way to account for the skewness in the spanwise profile, so we need to include some terms for that. Um, so I pulled uh, some inspiration from the skew normal distribution function, which is the function planted on the, or uh, excuse me, plotted on the right, um, that includes a skewness term with a skewness parameter alpha, and also allows for an offset term to be put in. So I put in the offset term, put in the skewness with the skewness parameter, um, and have a skewed Gaussian plume equation, so slightly modified from the previous one. Still have a term that covers spread in the in the spanwise basically the exact same term that covers spread in the, in the vertical. We now have the skewness term with a skewness parameter, uh, skewness parameter in it. A couple of the other variables have to be adjusted slightly to make sure that they, the, the equation still works as a solution to the, the advection diffusion equation. So this was then the equation we decided to analyze these plumes with, um, basically fit that uh, skewed Gaussian plume equation to all of the, all of the 12 plumes from the 2011 experiment um, using a, Nonlinear least squares optimization known as the trust region approach. Um, you can see the traditional Gaussian plume equation and the skewed Gaussian plume equation, just the quality of the fit on those, and it was a huge improvement over attempting to use just a, a standard Gaussian plume equation with R squared well above 0.9 on basically all of them. Uh, what this then allowed me to do, because now I have a, a, a really good informed, essentially interpolant of my three dimensional data that was collected in the field, we could then pull whatever sort of shape parameters that we wanted out of that. So I could get information about the, the, the spread and the spanwise, spread in the vertical, the offset, um, the skewness, all of those things at any number of X distances and could determine functional forms for those. So uh, functional forms were determined for all of those. Um, they have been published. Uh, yeah, basically all of them have been published in the paper that I had come out last year. Uh, we also developed a full model for this to be able to do offline sort of prediction of these sort of plumes. That has not yet been published and is currently um, I'm working on validating that model with the 2013 data, um, and there's a manuscript that's coming on that. I'm not going to talk any more about these because um, it's it's kind of a precursor to the next section anyway. Um, but yeah, all of that stuff is in the paper, uh, this paper here, um, if you're interested in any more of the details. And then some more of that actually feeds into the next section as well. Um, and that's chapter three of my dissertation um, came out last year. So moving on to the final aim here, so now looking at particle dispersion as a function of the actual wind direction within a canopy instead of just roughly row parallel periods. So same, uh, same uh, equipment was used for the particle dispersion, same rotating arm impaction traps, the array was reoriented such that we were catching um, the array or catching the particles as they were, they were going in other directions. Uh, we did uh, eight plumes in 2011 which have been analyzed but were inconclusive because we underestimated uh, the, the, the effects of the canopy in some ways and kind of missed where the plume was going. And so we have sort of the side of the plume without the whole thing. So there wasn't a lot we could do with that. We, we reoriented everything. We're much better prepared in 2013. 
And uh, there's actually 36 plumes that were collected in 2013 uh, under a range of, of wind conditions from 40 to basically 90 degrees. Um, and, and this is what I'm going to focus on for the next couple of minutes is these, is these 36 plumes. Um, so again, just looking sort of qualitatively at these, we're looking at isosurfaces of, of scaled concentration uh, downwind of the source. The resolution is really bad on this TV, but our source is here. Um, mean wind direction on this is basically due uh, perpendicular to the, to the vine rows, uh, where the one over here is about 45 degrees, so kind of going up and away from us there. And again, just kind of qualitative assessments, a couple things that we noticed uh, was that the, the width of the plume and spanwise direction tended to increase much more quickly than for the parallel plumes. Uh, makes sense. There was, it was a wider and flatter sort of spanwise profile. So you can imagine that for real parallel plumes, they, they're getting kind of channeled along the rows. Even though they do spread out in the spanwise, it's, it's somewhat tempered by the rows sort of trapping them in, where when the winds are blowing this direction, the, the vines have a tendency to spread the plumes out laterally much more. Um, this also ended up leading to a, we noticed a, a faster decay rate um, in, in the magnitude of the, of the concentrations with downwind distance than compared to the parallel plumes, um, just because I think a lot more of the particles are basically being filtered out by the vines. And you'll notice from the 45 degree one that it looks almost like a decent amount of the concentration is still being channeled into the vine row direction. We still have high concentrations going in that direction. Um, but you still also have kind of these wider, flatter profiles going in the other direction. And so this is what kind of got me thinking about using perhaps a composite of, of, a, of a near parallel plume and a, and a wider, flatter perpendicular plume as a way to analyze this. Um, so I tried originally fitting the skew Gaussian plume equation from the previous section to it. And though it did okay for some of them, the best R squareds I ever came up with was about a, a 0.86, which is pretty good. I mean, all things considered. That was the best I could come up with, and there were some of the plumes that had just absolutely failed miserably for it. It just it could not replicate them. And so based on this idea of using the composite of a perpendicular-oriented uh, signature and a parallel signature, um, I, I developed this that I refer to as the super gauss. I know. Um, so basically, this is two traditional sort of Gaussian plume equations with an offset term. But the, uh, they're oriented 90 degrees perpendicularly to each other. So one Gaussian plume equation oriented perpendicular to the vines and one oriented parallel to the vines that are then superposed by just basically summing the two together with a weighting factor. Um, the nice thing about using this weighting factor P in the summation here is, is uh, it always ends up summing to one, which means that the, this entire equation when integrated is still a solution to the advection diffusion equation, um, the PDE that, that uh, you know, that controls um, or that explains uh, dispersion downwind of the source. So it is still a solution to that. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way this was set up, I had to sort of assume forms uh, a priori for, um, for the, some of the different shape functions. So picked relatively generic ones that were pulled sort of from the literature and from what we learned from the, uh, from the parallel plumes. It gave me 15 parameters, essentially 15 knobs that could essentially be tuned, but they all have relevant physical meanings uh, controlling the rate of spread in one direction, the rate of spread in another direction, decay rates, et cetera, et cetera. They all have physical meanings. Um, and as I mentioned, yeah, there's a solution to the advection diffusion equation. So then this same, this uh, super gauss was then fit to the data for these plumes using the same approach, the nonlinear least squares optimization. Uh, I developed a, an optimization uh, sort of criteria that uh, would optimize them both in real space and log space simultaneously so that I'm optimizing sort of the near source data with the far, uh, far field data simultaneously. And we could discuss more if people have questions on what that means. Um, the nice thing was that the superposition of these two equations allowed basically me to fit to any arbitrary shape that, that could be found for a plume in that three-dimensional space. So the picture on the left is just a trilinear interpolation of the, of the raw data from the field. And a, uh, I would argue that a trilinear interpolation is actually less accurate than what I'm doing because it, it, it assumes uh, linear transitions between individual points of three-dimensional space, and we know linear transitions are actually inaccurate. The right then is my is my uh, equation fit to the data. So this was just a case with 40 degree winds. Um, there's then a case with 43 degree winds and a case with 62 degree winds, and uh, they all do really well. But you can see where sort of the signature of the the row parallel portion and the signature of the row perpendicular por perpendicular portion. Um, kind of are in the image and how they how they are smoothed together basically. Uh, so after optimizing, like I said, in both real and log space simultaneously, um, R squared values for so there's there's 12 events, three different colors, uh, 36 total plumes, and then you can see the real space and the log space per squareds 
uh, for all of them. Again, did really, really well. Uh, the broad majority over 0.9 um, for all of the plumes. A um, couple small exceptions to that, but overall, I was I was very satisfied with the with the quality of fits that we got from this equation. So, what this then allows us to do, because now I have a three dimensional interpolant that that is very accurately fit to all of the data, I can now use that fully three de uh, three dimensionally defined space to determine uh, shape parameters for the actual shape of the plume within that three dimensional space. Um, so could figure out basically by integra integrating that fit equation uh, anything that I really wanted to, you know, along any axis or anything inside, and then I could look at those as functions of downwind distance and, and, and more importantly as functions of, of the mean wind direction. So as expected, uh, P increased with delta, basically meaning that as uh, a, 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 a plume at 45 degrees versus a plume at 90 degrees, uh, the portion of the super gauss that uh, is oriented perpendicularly to the vines was responsible for more of the mass, so it made, it made sense. Um, looking then at the, the width of the plume in the spanwise direction um, and just kind of fitting this to the in integrated data just so that I could reduce the whole thing to basically a, a slope intercept sort of form. We could then look at a source size uh, of the plume and a rate at which the plume spreads out with downwind distance. Um, so this being for the spanwise and so here's my source size and my and my uh, the rate at which it spreads out the, the in the spanwise direction and notice that both of them increase with with delta, so the black dots that are on here are actually for the parallel plumes from the previous section, um, and all of the colored colored points are from uh, from the 36 plumes that were done as part of this. So basically, what this is telling us is that for row parallel uh, oriented plumes, particles are released at a point. They sort of spread out a little bit right there at the source, and then are vectored down to wind. And though they do spread out, it's not nearly as quickly as during uh, you know plumes that are much closer to perpendicular, where re they're released from a point they immediately spread out laterally into a much bigger sort of footprint size for the source and then also spread more rapidly as they go downwind from there. Uh, basically the same result was found for the vertical direction, um, uh, same, basically the same shapes uh, for the vertical direction as well. Uh, last, last result on this, um, the offset of the plume centerline uh, from the mean wind direction uh, for the plumes, so we're only talking about the 36 plumes that were here uh, tended to increase with downwind distance, but also decrease with delta. So the easy way to think about that is if you have a plume that's off by about 45 degrees from the mean wind or from the vine row direction, as you go downwind, so much of the mass is being channeled into the vine row direction that the distance between those two directions increases with downstream distance. Makes sense. But as you get towards a plume that is perfectly perpendicular, the the center line of the plume is not actually not really channeled in either direction because there's no reason that it should be biased towards row parallel this way or row, row parallel that way. And so actually the plume center line and the mean wind direction are actually almost identical, meaning that the offset goes to, you know, essentially zero. Um, anyway, it's, it's complicated, but uh, I, I didn't throw a plot on here for it, but uh, we can discuss if people want. And then uh, spanwise skewness and the spanwise kurtosis also tend to decrease with X, meaning that as you go downwind, um, your spanwise profiles are trending back towards being a symmetric Gaussian sort of profile. So near the source, big skewness one direction, big offset one direction, very peaked sort of sort of distribution, way downwind, symmetric, nearly Gaussian sort of shapes. Um, and then the other interesting thing was the the skewness and the kurtosis as function of the of the wind direction. So again, when you have a plume that's at about forty five degrees away, large amount of your mass is being channeled into the vine row direction long tail back the other direction at a very peak at distribution where when you have a perpendicular plume there's almost no skewness at all because there's no reason that it should be skewed one way or another and you also have a much flatter um, even boxier shaped sort of distribution in a spanwise direction instead of instead of a, a very peaked one so I realized how dense that was. Um, that's basically it for those plumes. That's all stuff that's been done in about the last year or so, and we have a whole uh, manuscript written up for that um, that uh, is about to be, we're hoping to have submitted to Agate Forest before Christmas, so uh, that's that's about done. So just to wrap up, and then I want to talk just one minute about uh, kind of future work. Uh, looked at the sort of the meteorolo meteorology, meteorological conditions within the vineyard and, and kind of figured out sort of the signature of the canopy architecture on the the turbulence and on the mean flow. Um, talked about the parallel plumes, which has been published in, in Agate Forest Meteorology and kind of the, the you know, figured out the skewed Gaussian equation that, that really gave us a lot of insight into what those look like. 
and then talked about the, the plumes as a function of the wind direction using the, the super gauss and, and were able to really sort of dial in what the plumes look like as a function of wind direction in the canopy. Um, collectively, I think that this gives us a really complete picture of plume dynamics in, in this sort of environment, um, which as I said at the top is something that's never really been studied before and, and, and was something that our USDA partners were very interested in. Um, I, I've said this many times, but basically for the parallel plumes, you know, you have a smaller source, everything's channeled right down the rows, it spreads out, but not very quickly. 45 degrees, you know, larger footprint at the source, huge skewness to one direction because it's all getting channeled and then towards the perpendicular, um, you, you don't have really any skewness, it's not really channeled any direction, um, and, but your decay is so much faster, uh, it decays faster as you go downwind. And all of these behaviors, I think, uh, we've tried to do this in the papers, uh, all of these behaviors are linked really well to things like those components of the flux tensor and the asymmetry of the flux tensor and the displacement line stuff. I think they're all very well linked to that within, within the papers that we've published. Um, so I just want to talk one minute, like I said, about uh, some of the future work. Uh, obviously, as I said, we've already developed a model for the real parallel plumes and, and are working on the validation uh, on that and hoping that uh, hoping the manuscript will come out for that relatively soon. Um, the next step, I think, is in a unified plume model that works for all of these, so for the parallel and the non-parallel ones. And really, the, the main goal at the end of this is to develop, to develop a whole vineyard ecosystem sort of model. Um, we'd like to be able to do season-long simulations of basically every process that happens in the vineyard, um, modeling the plants, modeling the, the meteorology, the dispersion, the, the biology, uh, the fungus, everything. Um, we'd like to be able to do all of that, you know, whole field scale uh, for whole season lengths, but there's still some some big elements of that that are that need to be developed that are being worked on. Um, I just want to mention Brian Bailey, who's working on uh, the plant growth and sort of the water and energy budget models. Um, he's published a couple papers on some of that recently that I've contributed data to, and I was actually a co-author on one. Um, the other thing I would point you to is his new website at UC Davis. Uh, for those that don't know, he's a professor at UC Davis now. Um, go to his website. There's some really awesome visualizations on some of the stuff that he's working on for, for energy budgets in the vineyard and, and plant growth vine growth sort of simulations that are they're they're beautiful brian does brian does really good work um, the other big uh, piece of of this this whole vineyard simulation is is we're hoping to use the quick urban industrial complex dispersion modeling tool uh, to do the the flow field uh, calculations for us at really high speeds so that if you're going to simulate an entire season at relatively low time steps you're going to need something really quick to be able to uh, to be able to simulate that I did a little bit of preliminary testing on the dispersion components within QUIC um, in, uh, in 2014, and now uh, most of that's been turned over to Lucas at this point, who's working on developing sort of the, or improving the, the flow uh, parameterizations as well as the, uh, hopefully eventually the dispersion parameterizations. And we have a lot of data, obviously, from my stuff that we can validate um, the, the QUIC stuff against, both on the, on the momentum side and the and the dispersion side. So all of those things kind of put together, Brian's stuff, the stuff Lucas is working on, and, and my stuff we're hoping to put together into one giant sort of vineyard simulation tool. Um, one of the next sort of steps that's a little further down the line that we've discussed is then linking that to larger scale um, existing weather sort of models like WARF or, or doing the particle tracking perhaps with, excuse me, with something like STILT at much larger scales. Everything that I've talked about here would obviously basically just be a a single point on the boundary condition for those sort of models because of the resolutions that those use. And so there is some work that would need to be done because there is still a big scale separation issue between a, you know, 100, 200, 300 meters in a field up to, you know, kilometers, tens, hundreds of kilometers for the, for this, uh, what's done in warp and still, but figuring out uh, how to get those to talk to each other for, for larger scale simulations, I think would be really useful. A um, couple other things that are going on. We've done some stuff with long distance dispersion in the field and I had a poster on that and there's actually more data that's been collected that's yet to be analyzed. Uh, we've also collected some uh, data looking at topographical influences in the field. So we've done plume releases going uphill and plume, plume releases going downhill and kind of laterally along the sides of hills. Again, hasn't really been analyzed yet, but now we have a basis through which we can we can hopefully get to analyzing those. Um, and then there, we've also debated doing some uh, subgrid scale coefficient um, calculations based on the data in the field. And I actually um, did some preliminary work for this a couple of years ago, and Rob and I have talked about it, but it's something, you know, maybe we'll get to uh, get to down the line. And with that, I'll close. Uh, I just want to mention again, uh, Rob, uh, thank you for everything, funding and everything, uh, you know, all the work that was put into getting the funding and everything so that I could run all of this. Walt, for all of the work that he put in in Oregon. Um, all of the people at the USDA, excuse me, especially Tara, uh, who did 
an incredible amount of work in a dark room under a microscope for me that just did, did uh, um, saved incredible amounts of time. Tara, Tara put in a lot of work. Um, and the other funding sources, as you see there. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Questions? Tim, please. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it was on your your parallel uh, dispersion, you talked about the uh, parameterization used for the dispersion, and they said you, you, you alluded that there's essentially 15 knobs. Um, right, so that, yeah, that's on the, <coughs> that's on the not parallel ones. Um, these images are so big, it lags out every time. Um, Here? Yep. So, uh, but you said they have physical, they have physical meaning. Um, what sort of, uh, what sort of parameters are in there, and can it be used just uh, you know, uh, independent of the uh, the location. You know, is this highly tuned to your data set, or can you apply this to an apple orchard? Oh no, yeah. So this this you know. um, I mean, this idea of using a the superposition of two Gaussian plume equations could really be used anywhere where this coordinate system is the coordinate system being used, right? Um, I mean, it may be more applicable in some places than other. I imagine. I mean, if you're doing dispersion in a free stream flow. Sure, you could use this and define a or an orthogonal coordinate system, and it would st it should still be able to create, you know, sort of the arbitrary shape that you want within that space. Um, it's maybe not the best idea for, to use in that in a free stream flow or something, but for any similar architecture to a vineyard, anything um, you know, like a, an orchard or anything else, it I imagine it should work work very well. And the same sort of interpretations would, excuse me, would work in that environment as as work in line. So, yeah. so are you in the in the parameters? Are you using canopy parameters? No, now? there's no the the 15 parameters that I speak of here are basically just uh, like rate rates at which the plume spreads out uh, with downwind distance, uh, decay rates, which is essentially accounting for uh, deposition of the particles into the vines or onto the ground, loss of mass essentially. Mm -hmm. So loss of mass, you know, rates at which it spread. Could those things then be correlated to? Uh, you know the information from the turbulence field, or, or correlated to uh, you know relevant canopy length scales, or, or uh, canopy time scales, or something. Sure, those could be, but the equation itself doesn't have any of that information inherently inside. So, Kevin. So on the same note, for uh, predictive purposes, just to make sure, it kind of clarifies. So you're saying that it could be tied to the other turbulence parameters. You don't necessarily need a full data set to tune it to have predict what the plume is doing. So yeah, I'm not really using this as a predictive tool at this point, right? Um, that would be sort of the next step of how do you come up with the the kind of offline functional forms on how to use this as a predictive tool. Where if you had you know meteorological conditions and some relevant length scales in a specific canopy, how could you then estimate all of these parameters to use this as a predictive tool? And we haven't taken that next step yet. That's kind of more on the modeling side. At this point, it's really more of just an analysis procedure where it's just a really fancy curve fit, essentially a three-dimensional curve fit that allows me to interpolate uh, or to integrate along any sort of axis to determine sort of the shape of the plume as a whole. Um, those next steps of going to be able to do sort of offline prediction, we've done those for the parallel plumes, and that's sort of the validation stuff that I have done a little bit of and that we have a manuscript that's written uh, that early next year sometime will probably come out. I've done all of those steps for the parallel plumes. I've not yet done that for for this um, for this equation and for the, the non-parallel plumes. Yeah, because there is definitely another step you have to make there to be able to relate those things in a, you know, in a physically relevant, you know, sort of functional way to be able to make predictions. But yeah, we haven't we haven't taken that leap yet. So, yeah. I just want to give you another question. Like, if I want to minimize the dispersion in the canopy, can I tune these with canopy canopy orientation or canopy parameters? Um, you know that that's one of the questions that we debated way back at the very beginning. Of this whole project was could we use things that we learned from this project to inform the way that that vineyards are designed right. almost right and I don't know that I've, I've come to any conclusions on, on that at this point I don't know that we've ever actually like kind of finished that conversation because we speculated early on that you know perhaps adjusting the spacing of the rows in one direction or another or, or taller canopies or shorter canopies or north to south orientation versus something off from north to south depending on what the dominant wind direction is 
that maybe you could you could make some of those decisions before planting your vineyard and and create some natural defenses against dispersion. I I still believe that there probably are some conclusions there that we could come to. I don't know that we've ever or I or that in, in any of our meetings or anything that we've ever really discussed you know specifics on what those would be. Um, obviously, I mean the decay rate, as I said before, is much quicker during perpendicular periods than during parallel periods, meaning that a lot more of the particles are being filtered out much closer to the source uh, than during parallel periods. So I don't know if, you know, depending on what your dominant wind direction is in the in the area where you're planting your vineyard, if you just always plant it perpendicularly to that dominant wind direction, it would reduce a considerable amount of your of your, you know, the distance of your dispersion. Again, light penetration and those sort of things become part of the conversation there because you also want to optimize that to make sure that your vines actually are getting the light and, and you know, everything else that they need. So are there things there that could perhaps be figured out? I, I imagine that there is. We, I don't, we haven't really gone into any specifics on that at this point. But, yeah. Good. And hey. Who's Walt. that? Walt? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in reference to your last answer right there. Would uh, planting perpendicular to predominant wind actually decrease distance of spread, or would it decrease probability of near distance but increase long distance spread? Absolutely valid question. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's interesting because though your decay rate sort of within the canopy is 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 much quicker, um, you know, for the perpendicular sort of in that near source. Rob and I have also speculated that the perpendicular periods probably also have a higher likelihood of ejecting more of the mass out of the top of the canopy, just out of a conservation of mass sort of sense, where your plume is going along and it, you know, there's there's a resistance in front of it. It's going to be forced to sort of spread out uh, more in the vertical direction. And we saw that the vertical direction does it does actually spread quicker in the vertical direction during perpendicular periods. So. I think it would reduce a lot of those, you know, reduce, a, you know, at the second, third, fourth row, it would probably reduce the amount of, of spores that are getting there. But yeah, there is probably a potential to eject more that then end up going considerably further. Um, I don't know that there's a way necessarily for us to investigate that specifically within the data that I have with the sort of resolutions that we have, but there's, you could, yeah, I think that's a possibility, I believe. So, sure. Yeah. Well, this data actually fits, um, some population genetics work from Michael Milgram at Cornell, where they found clonal populations had a higher probability of being a long row. Okay. And then 80 to 100 meters distal, but not to be on adjacent rows. Right. So in the near source, they were always being channeled down the row, but then right. 80 meters away, they were kind of, they were in other directions and things because they were being ejected and going that far. That makes sense. Yeah, no, and I think, I think the data that we have here and sort of the interpretations that, you know, that I've made, I think would, would uh, you know, would, would support that um, and, and, and explain that relatively well. Yeah. Kevin? Uh, yeah, so were your uh, release sources primarily near kind of a leading edge of the vineyard or were they fairly deep? Every everything that was done here was was considerable distances away from any from any edges. So we picked we picked a relatively you know big uh, you know well grown sort of block of the vineyard uh, that first year that we were out there and we put all of our equipment right in the middle of it. We had really long upwind um, distances of re nearly uninterrupted vines in basically you know all of the primary directions that we were interested in. So winds primarily out of the north and out of the southwest was what were the dominant two wind direction. So we had hundreds of meters of nearly continuous vines upstream of those um, for basically everything that was being done here. Yeah. And then the actual source, the actual uh, point source devices themselves, we put right up really close to an individual vine within the canopy because that's where the spores would typically be being released from is the, um, if I understand correctly, usually the underside of leaves or pop possibly the top surfaces of leaves. So we actually put our devices right up, you know, almost against the leaves on one vine so that they were being released as if from the leaves and then um, they were allowed to be, you know, blown downwind from there. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. And, and this is why I didn't need, um, can you talk a little bit about the parameters that you used for your model? Like you said, all parameters. 15. Uh, so, Okay. Um, like, are they all physical or are they? Something? They all have. They all have 
physically and relevant they, interpretations. They, can you repeat the question for us? Please? Oh yeah, so RS just asked me to, if I would just uh, just mention what the 15 parameters are in the super gauss and kind of mention, you know, what the, the physical sort of interpretation of each one is. So uh, in each one of the two portions here, uh, let's see if I can remember all 15 off the top of my head. In each of the two portions here, there are six variables. Um, so you have you have this uh, magnitude sort of decay rate. Um, you have a spread in the spanwise or a, a width in the spanwise, a width in the vertical. Um, you have an offset in the spanwise. You have an effective plume uh, center line. Is that all of them? One, two, three, four, five. I think there's six in each. Now you've got me. Now you've got me questioning what they were. I looked. I just looked it up when I made this, and I know it was it was fifteen. Um, what just happened? <laughs> Who killed the TV? Uh, apparently, it goes to sleep if you don't do anything for a long time. Um, I'm trying to remember now what. Uh, maybe it was only five in each one. So anyway, in each one though, you have the decay rate, you have the width in each of the directions, you have an offset, and you have the effective height. Um, each one of those then was. Um, oh no! So that's okay. So one, two, three. Four. This one is actually the same, kept the same, consistent in both of them. I thought I had that on here, but it was kept the same. So there's only four. Mu, there's other terms there. Right. So there's only four variables in each one of the two, but then in each one of them with the assumed forms, there's multiple variables. So this is where the six comes from. So you have uh, one that is essentially the rate, the decay rate in an exponential decay. Um, one in the perpendicular direction, one in the parallel direction. Right. You have the the width. Of the plume in each direction, and you have a, you, so you, then you have a source size and a rate in the perpendicular direction and and the parallel direction. So uh, by having this equation oriented both in the parallel and the perpendicular, this allows you to create. Uh, you can imagine it almost as like an ellipsoid sort of source size, where it has one dimension in one direction going this way and a different dimension in this direction going this way. So that, that becomes this, and then the rate at which it spreads in each of those directions are independent. Same thing for the vertical direction, um, and then you just have a basically a linear offset with downwind distance for the perpendicular portion and the parallel portion. So they'll have relatively straightforward sort of you know physical physical meanings with, with how they go. And then um, P obviously was one of the 15, um, and then as I mentioned, uh, the effective plume centerline height. I actually kept that equation, I, I played around with this, but found that it worked really well to just keep that equation the same for both of the two portions. So included in that though, there are two unknowns, one that is an initial fall distance. So when the, the particles are being released from the devices, they tend to, to you know, kind of fall out of the device before being taken by the wind. And so you have an initial fall distance of, it ranges between maybe 10 and, and pushing maybe 30 centimeters or so, give or take. So. Um, in, in, inside this, there's that initial fall distance and then a, uh, a settling uh, velocity with downwind um, direction as well that are both accounted for there. So six times two plus two plus one, um, 15 total. Yeah, now, uh, what is your bottom like? Uh, let's say if you want to apply this model to another canopy, are these like these parameters, are they, do you expect all of them to change dramatically or for other like? The range and uh, like for example, you use a more dense wind yard or um, so yeah the canopy height. Okay, yeah. sure. So following kind of with what Tim's question was before, I think you could absolutely fit this to data in other canopies. That being the case, you could fit this to any plume essentially. Um, you know, would the actual values of these change significantly? I think that they probably would because they should be. And this going back to Kevin's question. They should be linked to relevant meteorological and, and canopy architecture sort of variables, right? The, the size of the source of the plume, how far it spreads out sort of in this direction, how far it spreads out in this direction, how far it spreads out in this direction before being advected downwind, those things are going to be dictated a lot by how much sort of mixing there is right directly at the point source, what sort of gaps are available for it to spread out in. Uh, you know, are the vines forcing it to spread in one direction or forcing it to spread in another direction? Or if you were in an orchard or something like Tim said before, perhaps there wouldn't be an asymmetry there in, you know, it spreads out more in this direction than in this direction before leaving because, you know, perhaps an orchard or something wouldn't have that asymmetry would cause that sort of thing. So the idea, back to sort of Kevin's question, is that, you know, once this is sort of fit to any individual canopy, that these variables should absolutely be linked to the canopy architecture. And figuring out those links is what is then necessary to be able to use this as an offline sort of predictive tool 
to be able to predict where plumes are going instead of just fitting to data that you already have, right? Um, but yeah, the date change, but should ideally still be correlated to um, you know relevant variables within within the canopy. So, your questions. Okay, let's take our speaker one more time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.